I'm going to do it twice. <laughs> In case you didn't get it right the first time. Yeah. It's on the internet, too, you know. Okay, so it's kind of printed print on the bits. Okay. Do you have the bits that you were going to yes, get? Yes, I do. Finally. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to give it to you last Tuesday, and I didn't give it to you. That was kind of a funny deal, wasn't it? Okay. So, let me get it now. Okay. <coughs> it might still be another snow day. I'll give you another 16. Well, of course, that's going to be new material that you probably don't want to look at forever. But, um... Hey, they're doing my note 16. Maybe I didn't bring them. <coughs> oh, they're back here. Right. Some more notes. Save these for the okay. next week. Okay, so this is now what your 18. Okay, the homework is going to be due. I have officially postponed the homework due this week until Thursday. You got back from Germany already? Okay. So, uh, but for the following week, November, the, I think the homework 10 or 9, that's going to be due November 14th. So I'm going to go back to Tuesdays. Okay? So this week, we're going to try to get this chapter 5 out of our hair and cover chapter 6. Okay? <coughs> As well. Let's go over the review exam. So. I really don't like this chapter. Chapter 5 you don't like? Okay, some people, when they took 381, they didn't really go over the central limit theorem, they just did the application of confidence intervals and so on. It was like, oh, you don't need to know the theorem, just do the confidence intervals. Okay? Maybe it was, it was the end of the course or whatever. So, chapter 5, some people had some of it, some people didn't. Okay, so let's go over it a bit. Uh, I just handed off some notes, uh, 15 and 16. Um, so. And let's just have to see what the central limit theorem is. This often takes a pretty um, theoretical approach to chapter 15. We did do the strong law of large numbers last time, so I won't go over that again. <coughs> but we do want to talk about the central limit theorem. Are there questions about your homework before we get that going? Yeah. First questions, okay? <laughs> the questions. Let's do the apply part first, and then we'll go back and go to concept. <coughs> We're going to do another problem or two, okay? One of the problems was number 15, by the way. There's a correction to problem number 15, and because the answer in the back uh, was right for one set of parameters, but wrong for your set of parameters that were given. I'm going to correct uh, 5.15 correction. Change from 50 to 200 independent fair games. Better play at five dollars a piece. I posted that on the web. It was not posted. Okay. The due date was also changed and posted. Okay, so it's been updated. The next two homework assignments have been posted. Everything due to Thanksgiving. Getting on to the very end of the course. So, one more test. Imagine this one coming up. Okay. Change from 50 to 200 independent fair games in that problem where you're playing fair games at $5 a pop. Okay? The chance you could lose $75 or more is only probable if you're playing a bunch of games. 50 games is not enough. The probability is zero to lose $75 if you're playing $5 a game. If you only play 50 games, <coughs> so the answer is zero for the problem is stated. I think you get it. It all depends on what z-score you compute. I think for the z-score, the, the z for the problem is stated originally was negative 
the z for the problem as corrected is negative 2.1. Okay. Go ahead. Um, for number 22, isn't it supposed to be equal to 0.95 instead of 1? Yeah, it probably doesn't want a correction there. Well, it doesn't make much sense. Either. Yeah, there's another correction. I probably didn't put that on the website. Okay. Number 22. Um, no, well, yeah, I have a correction there too. Less than or equal to point, delta equals 0.95. So for that, you need the variance, where variance of i hat of f is shown. I did tell you where to get it, but I'll just write it down. It's 1 over n squared i of f squared minus i of f quantity squared. Where i of f is, where i just means the integral from 0 to 1. So i of A equals 0, B equals 1. shown as the answer to 21b. If you look at the answer to 21b in the book, <coughs> chapter 5, you'll see this answer for the variance of the estimate of the integral. 21b, if I'll show you that, only it's for a equals 0, b equals 1, and g equals to 1. So there was a, a more generalized version of this problem, number, problem number 21. So A equals 1? A equals 0, B equals 1, G equals 1. Oh, okay. Did you get the same answer there? Okay. Okay. So, so what's going on? Is, what is I hat of F? I hat of F is simply equal to, what, what, what do you have? You have that I of F is the integral 0 to 1 f of x dx, right? Well, we, and I just showed this in my office to you, right? We said this is the same thing as the uh, integral 0 to 1 of f of u times 1 du. Now, f is the function, not the density. So you have to think of that as a density, okay? No, not a density. You have to think of 1 as the density. f is the function, okay? So this is the expected value of f of a uniform ramp variable. Okay? So by the law of large numbers, I can write an expected value of a random variable, expected value of x, right, as a limit x1 plus x2 plus xn divided by n. n goes to infinity. So that means f of u1 plus the so on plus f of u n divided by n, or x n is equal to f of u n. This is a random variable. That's one. First random variable, second random variable, nth random variable. I'm just writing the random variable as f of capital E. All right. And, um, and this is what we're calling i hat. So the n of f, you might call it that. 
what's the limit or what's the alpha function? There's alpha limit. The limit is just the, is the i of f. This is your i of f. Right, we're saying that with probability 1, this limit is equal to i of f. <laughs> How close is it though? So this is a random variable. We're saying this random variable converges to a constant. It actually converges, converges what we said almost surely. The weak law of large numbers said that it converged in probability. The strong law of large numbers told us that it converges to probability 1. It's the stronger sense of convergence. I won't go back over that again. That's more advanced concepts. All right? But we did cover it. So this, this is simply going there. Okay? No matter what simulation you do, all right, if it then gets big enough, you'll get this up. But it might go slowly. Right? How fast does it go there? You have to compute. You know, you have to compute. And what you're asking here is, is basically uh, find delta, basically find how far away you could be. Okay? Delta is how far away you could be. Yeah. So the expected value of I had is I of f, right? Expected value of i hat of f is uh -huh. i of f. The expected value of this is that. <coughs> this, yeah, I'm, this is a, uh, this is not a expected value. This is just a random variable. Uh -huh. But the, and the expected value of this d is i of f. Okay. Uh -huh. But that's where the center of the curve is. Oh. Yeah. That's expected value is this. Is. Yeah. The expected value is this. Uh -huh. This is unbiased for i of f. It's an estimator of i of f. Uh -huh. I hat. You say, this is unbiased for that. This is the parameter. This what is the number of bias or There's no bias. In other words, the expectation is equal to it. E i hat of f is equal to i of f. Something is unbiased for a parameter if the expectation is equal to that. The bias is the difference between what you're trying to estimate and the expectation of what you're trying to estimate. Okay? So the bias, if, if theta hat estimates theta, then the bias is equal to expectation of theta hat minus theta. Okay? To, I, that's all it is. So here you have an unbiased estimator. I'm going to start introducing some of this statistical terminology. Just the, the parameter of theta here is some integral. Okay? It's a very simple, simple uh, estimator. It's just the average bunch of independent identity distributed random variables. Okay? It's a very simple estimator. <coughs> when S theta, when, when you have some, maybe a nonlinear estimator kind of a thing, is what we're thinking of. The bias, this would be, a, you know, something to calculate or estimate. Bias too. Right, we're going to get to that a little bit in chapter seven. Very end. Okay. We're going to talk about a ratio estimator. Okay. And so then there will be a non-trivial bias. Okay. So and so now what is the? Though this is just an average of, of a bunch of independent identity distributed random variables that have mean and variance and so on. So by the central limit there, this is approximately a normal random variable. Okay. So I hat of f is roughly, is approximately normal. And what's the, the mean would be I of f, and what's the variance? We just said it was right over we just said it was over there. <laughs> variance I hat of f. The variance of you know the variance of the random <laughs> what it is. So, okay. And then you can actually calculate that in this problem. Okay? You can actually calculate the variances in this problem. You have to do a couple of integrals, right? You have f x equals cosine of 2 pi x or something like that. You have to calculate the integral of cosine squared. The integral of the cosine is 0. I had of f was 0 in this problem, right? I mean, I of f was 0. 
Uh, and there, in your poem, yeah. I, I have F is just zero in your, in, in your problem 22. Okay? So the, but the I of F doesn't come into it at all except to make this calculation of variance. Alright? Because of the way they set up the problem. So this is, the, this is your sigma square. You have to calculate it. Okay. This is your mu, which in this case is equal to zero. Okay? For 522. And so they're asking for the probability that that your that your i hat of f minus zero, okay, is less than or equal to delta equals 0.95. Okay. Well, delta is just um, you know how to do that in terms of standard deviation. What you know is that if I divide by if I divide by the standard deviation here, then this is approximately n zero one sitting here. So this is this is the same as saying that the probability of n zero one, okay, standard normal variable absolute value, let's here with delta over sigma equals 0.95. Okay. Because when I take and I subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation of something which is approximately normal, then I get approximately n zero one. Okay. So what's the, can I do this with any random variable, whatever in the world? Not quite. The random variable I apply, I apply this often. Okay, where I subtract the mean, divide by the standard deviation. I get something that's approximately n zero one, standard normal. I can do it when. The random variable is the sum of small parts, each approximately the same and independent. Okay? Same in size. In other words, here, all of these are about the same in size. They all have the same variability. And I've added a bunch of independent things. And I get to apply the, the uh, potential limit there in any such case. Bernoulli random variables have a very, very small parameter. Okay? So if I take a bunch of Bernoulli P's, if I add a bunch of Bernoulli P's, if I take Bernoulli, so it's not, you have to be careful about the variance being big enough. If I take Bernoulli P, okay, and P is very small, and I add them up, add independent Bernoulli P's, these are indicator variables. That means they're one or zero, probability of In other words, I flip a coin, there's a very small probability of being hits. Okay, and I take the total number of heads. <laughs> Bernoulli P is, is, is one or zero according to whether I get heads or tails on the coin. Okay, so flip a coin, and have a very small probability of coming up heads. Okay. All right, so almost always comes up tails, but occasionally comes up heads. All right? So flip it, let's say I flip it only a hundred times, okay? Is my total number of heads, is that approximately a normal variable? No. It's, it's, it's pretty Yeah, it's still going to be, you know, a binomial variable. Uh, a bi what I get is, then I get an obtained binomial. Wouldn't it be sort of like a cosine? If, it, if you flip it every time, then you get like one. Like, like yeah, if P is very small, I get a binomial NP, okay. So the mean is NP and the variance is NP1 minus P. So if NP is still small, I get a binomial NP1 minus P. So the mean is NP and the variance is NP1 minus P. So if NP is still small, the variance is still small, then, uh, well, I'll, for sure I'll get something that's skewed, okay? But the only question is whether the main part of the curve is, is symmetric, okay? So binomial NP, so I get something that looks like, if P is very small, I get something that looks like this, okay? But 
And we know that uh, if P is very small and N is large, I guess something looks like a Poisson. Okay? It's a discrete random variable. It's still an integer number of heads. But um, if the variance is big enough, then the main part of this curve still looks symmetric. Okay? And it'll have a normal shape. But if NP is not big enough, then it's, it's not normal. Okay? So the fact is, a Poisson with a high parameter itself is approximately normal. You have to apply that in one of your problems. A Poisson with a parameter 100, that's approximately normal. So that corresponds to NP being 100. That's okay. But if NP is still only 3, then the central limit there doesn't give you a very good approximation. So it's really not the number, it's the size of the variance got bigger. Okay? But what happens if the parameter is large um, well, like not artificially because P is somewhat larger? Like, um, the basis for Poisson is that you have large and small p. Right. And it looks, you're saying it looks like a normal one, and p, the lambda, is large. Right. But you can get a large lambda by making p larger. No, because then you know, then the Poisson limit doesn't come in. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, you can get a large lambda by making a big Poisson lambda, but you can't, you're not getting it from a binomial with large p. I mean, what you can do is you can take n go to infinity, and if what they have the counterexample that I was just talking about, where p is very small and n is large. What they do is you get a different. You do, the central limit theory is different. You talk about triangular arrays. In other words, you take x one and then x one plus x two, and you allow in these each row a different uh, parameters. Okay, uh -huh. x one three plus x two three plus x3, 3. If you let the, you know, if you, if, if the row is the nth row, okay, and you let p go be a function of n, like 1 over n, okay, so what you're going to get is, is that the sum of the x's is, is approximately a Poisson in that case. You're not getting a normal one. So if you allow a triangular array set to so you get it, you don't get a such one. You have to have more hypotheses. So there are central limit theorems for triangular arrays. Okay? Triangular arrays? Yeah. Where you let some of the param you let your parameters vary okay. and so on. Yeah. Here I'm just taking one density and then saying, ah, oh, everybody's got to be the same when n goes to infinity, then I get the central limit there. Okay? Uh -huh. But if I allow my density to change in each row, okay, then I get the So does that work for everything? If it, the parameter is the same? If you do over and over again? If you do over and over again, eventually I'm getting a normal variable. Okay? For any sort of distribution? For any density, that's what I said. Any kind of wow. density, as long as it had a mean and a variance. Okay. Okay. Is everybody getting the concept now? Kind of? Uh, you haven't had a session like that before. Um, okay. That's the application. We know what the statement is, roughly. Let's let's go back and talk about the theory just a little bit. Okay, so let's mathematically <coughs> discuss you would formulate the central limit theorem and prove the central limit theorem. Just to talk about it just a little bit anyway. So first I need a definition. Um, let Z1, Z2, and so on be a sequence of random variables. With respective distribution functions, F one. 
one of x, f2 of x, and so on. Why am I calling these random variables z? Because I'm not, because they're going to be the, uh, they're going to play the role of the normalized random variable. Not the role of the individual summits. Okay. That's why I'm calling them Z. Distribution functions f1, f2 of x, and so on. Okay? We say Z in convergence and distribution. So this is convergence and distribution of random variables. We say Z n, the random variable converges in distribution. to uh, z, to a random variable z, with distribution function capital F of x. And in our application of the central limit theorem, capital Z is going to be a standard normal variable, and capital F of x is going to be the standard normal cumulative distribution function, capital phi. In our application, if um, limit, if the limit of the distribution function is pointwise is equal to the limiting distribution function, n goes to infinity. But only for, uh, then there's a little caveat here which may be a little confusing, at each continuity point, I'm doing this in general, continuity point x of the limiting distribution function and the x. Okay, let's just have a little counterexample to see what can happen. Let's take an example of what you have to talk about like that. Let's take problem 5.28. This gives us a little bit of theory, but more or less we'll do it anyway. Okay? Um, we're going to talk about the following situation. You can find a density, but fn of x equal the following density, um, 2 to the n if x is in minus 1 over 2 to the n to minus 1 over 2 to the n plus 1 is an interval near the origin of length, and then, or 2 to the n if x is in the interval 1 over 2 to the n plus 1 to 1 over 2 to the n, okay, and 0 else. So I'm going to take a density, be a density, density defined like this, okay? This is what 12, 5, 1, 28 is. How did you get f of x of n equals 2 to the n? I thought it was half. Oh, yeah. Fn of sequence of frequency function with fn of x equals a half, if x equals plus or minus one half. Yeah, maybe they made a mistake. Okay? I think they made a mistake here. Yeah. That's that's wrong. Okay? Yeah. This is right. Okay. <laughs> okay. You're very close to the origin. The interval here is one over two to the n. Here's one over two to the n plus one. Okay? The width of this interval is one over two to the n plus one. Okay, because this is how it goes. 1 over 2 of the n plus 1 is 1 half of the way. All right? So this interval equals that interval. And this interval you're, you're focusing on. So you have a density which is very high there. Okay? And also very high on the other side of the origin. So two spikes. Okay? Like that. Two spikes on either side of the origin. And they have to have total area 1. Right? If it have total area 1, and this is width 1 over 2 to the n plus 1 that has height 1 over 2 to the n, so the area for this spike is 1 half, the area for that spike is 1 half. Two to the n. Is that not right? Yeah. 2 to the n times 1 over 2 to the n plus 1 is a half. Yeah. That's the height of the density. I don't know. He might have been talking about capital of the vaccine. He made a mistake. Don't worry about it. The example is clear to me, though. Okay, so this is a density, and it's a sequence of densities. What if n is greater than one? I mean, this is still converging. 
closer and closer to zero? Yeah, it looks like the random, what I have is a, take a sequence of random variables that has these, the, the random variables, there's no discussion of independence or anything, this is just, all I'm really talking about is the distribution functions. Yeah. Okay? But it, I can talk about a random variable that has this density, okay? For the density, I think it looks, but what's n? n is? It's just a parameter. It's n oh. to infinity, positive integer. Oh, so, so you're taking n equals 1 or something. n equals 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. I mean, you know, just let it go to infinity. I'm going to let n go to infinity. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and so on. Okay? Mm -hmm. So the random variables or the, with these densities are going to 0, right? Uh -huh. It's either, you know, this is a tiny number, okay? With some probability, one half on either side. Okay? This is a continuous random variable still. But so what? Okay, it's going to 0, obviously. And in fact, what is the limit of fn of x? as x goes to infinity. That's not even a density anymore. If I fix any x in the in the universe, okay, on the real axis, mm -hmm. anyway, <laughs> get a real value of x, okay, but x equals zero, what's the limit of f n of x at x equals zero? It exists and it's equal to zero, because I left zero out here, all right? If I take any other number, let's say x equals 0 0.01, well, eventually, the n, one of two to the n is going to bypass it, okay? The spike's going to bypass it and go into the origin, so you're going to be left with zero there. So even though so fn of x is going to go way up, but it's going to go back down to zero, okay, if x is very, very small. In other words, think of the sequence of the numbers fn of x for fixed x and n go to infinity. Here's a very, very small x. Okay, so the spike is going to come along and it's going to go, it's going to cover x, but then it's going to go by. As n gets bigger and bigger, the spike gets taller and taller. Okay? Mm -hmm. So then fn of x is going to be 0 for that fixed x for all large n, where n depends on x, but it's still eventually 0. So this limit is 0 for every x. <coughs> this is n goes to infinity, I'm sorry. For every x in the real line. That means that, there's, that, the, that even though I took a limit of densities, I don't have a density in the end. Okay, the. the um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, so there's no density, all right? It's called the local limit theorem if the densities converge, okay? There is no local limit theorem. Now, so I'm getting into a bunch of terminology, but anyway, this can happen. Now, what is the fn of x? fn of x equal to, do the distribution functions converge? They should, if everything is good, because the random variables obviously converge to zero, okay? So the distribution functions converge in this sense, okay? Let's see what they do. Fn of x is what? It's a very high slope, okay? Um, the slope is 2 to the n on a certain interval, okay? Okay, so it's 0 here. It's a very high slope, and it goes up to 1 half, okay? Then it's just constantly zero here because there's no slope. And then there's a very high slope again. Okay. And it goes up to one. And then you're done. Okay? Uh, this is two, 1 over 2 to the n. And this is the height of 1. Okay? On the y axis. This is capital Fn of x. This is x. This is minus 1 over 2 to the n. Minus 1 over 2 to the n. Okay, so that's what it looks like. It looks like this little stair step thing. Okay? There's a very narrow step here, of course, so it's just a little notch in the wood. Okay? <laughs> All right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Keep going up. You didn't go over very far either. Only went over a little bit. But anyway, it goes up like that. So what's the limit of that function? That's a good distribution function. What's the limit of that? Well, it'll be zero. It'll always be one half in the middle. Okay, it's not going to be a distribution function either. Okay, the limit won't be. So limit f n of x as that goes to infinity. This is this is a good real analysis problem to see what all the limits are, right? This is zero for x less than zero. It's one half for x equal to zero, and it's one for x bigger than zero. Okay, which almost looks like a distribution. Of the trivial of the trivial random variable, which is okay, but it's this, this, and 
this. Okay? This is the limit. All right? Now that's equal to a real distribution function at every continuity point of the real distribution function. The real distribution function is g of x equals to 0 for x less than 0 and 1 for x greater than or equal to 0. That's a real distribution function because it's because it has left limit, it's right continuous. You can have jumps. That's a real. This is this is a real distribution function. It's a distribution function of the random variable, which is a constant, namely the random variable, which is everywhere zero. The zero random variable. Okay. That's a distribution function of zero. Yeah. So this limit f n of x is equal to g of x at every continuity point of g of x. So you don't have to count x equal to zero because it's not a continuity point. So I do have limited distribution. So. <laughs> so when x is zero equals half for this function, well, f g of zero is one. F the limit of this sequence at zero is one half. So these functions are not equal, but they're equal at every continuity point of the ladder. They're equal. They're equal at every continuity point of G. What do you mean con A point of continuity. X equals zero is not a point of continuity of this function. Oh, okay. That's all. It's just continuous step. Continuity point, point where it's continuous. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I know that's math ease for a point where it's continuous. Okay? This is a continuity point. So this has one point of discontinuity. So I don't have to count that. All right? And otherwise, therefore, this limit is equal to that. That's what it means. Okay? So here I have convergence in distribution to the zero random variable. But I do not have convergence to the densities. Okay? Like the limit of fn of x is not even close to a density. Okay? Somehow the problem, yeah. Okay. So there's a little example to go with this definition. Okay? I don't know. <laughs> okay. So that's what convergence and distribution is, and it seems to be the right definition. Now, then what's the central limit theorem? Okay? The central limit theorem is indeed you do get some convergence and distribution in the context. Of, well, let's see. What is it? Well, here's the theorem. The theorem, the continuity theorem. See, what is it? It's the um, theorem A, then. Then out of uh, page 181, tells you if the moment generating function uh, exists and converts to a, moment gen a known moment generating function, then you do get convergence and distribution. If um, M N of T now equals expectation e to the tz n now in the same context. So we could apply it here. See if these moment generating functions exist. Nothing below. Exists. No, no, no. Below. For t, let's say, in minus delta, delta for all n. Okay. And if m n of t converges as n goes to infinity, so a known moment generating function, m of t equals expectation e to the t z for some random variable z. Okay. All right. That has a distribution function, you know, capital M of x or whatever. Okay, here I might be talking about the random variable z, which is zero. Okay? If I take the if I take the moment generating function of this density, what do I get? Yeah, I'm just gonna I'm gonna get one half e to the minus something or other plus one half e to the something or other, which is gonna be real just gonna go to the moment generating function of that. Um, did you say the density of this or the um, I'm just saying the moment generate if the moment generating exists for all t minus delta delta. Okay? I don't have to do anything about densities, so I don't even have to have densities. Okay. 
No, where density is a special problem, right? I'm going to write it for it. So I don't even need densities. And if this holds for some random variable z, then <laughs> we always have densities. Wait, we always have densities. <laughs> Not always, actually. But we haven't considered it in this course. So pretending so we always have densities. Okay? So then, um, then indeed, then Zn converges to distribution to Z. And this is for all, for, and, which, and we're assuming that T exists for T and minus delta and delta here. I don't think they really put this in the theorem in the book, but they really should be saying that this moment generating function should also exist in minus delta and delta. Um, okay. Here. Okay, so suppose we have convergence of the moment generating functions to a known moment generating. small interval about the origin and all everything exists in that small interval about the origin. All no generating functions exist in that small interval about the origin. Then we do indeed get conversion to distribution of Z. So if moment generating functions converge, then you get conversion to distribution. Okay. That's a theorem we're not going to prove. That's just a theorem about you can check this conversion to distribution by you know, checking the transforms converge. Okay. The transforms converge then we're not going to go through that whole theory. But it goes, this is the theorem that goes with the definition. Right? We'll take the transform. So now what we want to do is we want to prove that in the context of the fence limit theorem that we do indeed get this convergence of the transforms, the moment generating functions. Okay. What's the, uh, what's the transform of the uh, standard normal? We knew what that was, right? Either the t squared over 2 or something. So, to get the central limit there. Okay. Let now be this. Okay. So let um, x1, so CLT. Let x1, x2, and so on be a sequence of, of independent random variables Each having the same distribution function, so they're identically distributed. We say identically distributed. There's one way of trying to point that out a little bit. Each have the same density. Okay. sequence and each has the same density. And we're moreover we're going to assume that they all that the moment generating function exists. Uh, and where each i xi also has moment generating function. So we're going to assume a lot more than just the 
same density, we're going to assume at the moment generating a function exists. M1 of t minus delta less than t less than delta. With m1 prime of 0, with m1 prime of 0 equal to 0, I'm going to assume 0 mean and varying sigma squared. Just to, I'm going to take the mean out of the picture because um, I can take the variance out of the picture too, but I don't want to. The mean is easy to get out of the picture. I'm just going to center all the random variables to begin with. Okay, I'm assuming that the mean exists and I'll center it, so I'm assuming the mean is zero and variance is sigma squared. So all of them have the same distribution, function, or density, and moreover that the moment generating function of that density exists. Okay, I'm going to assume that it has mean zero and variance sigma squared. This will give variance sigma squared because of the calculation of the variance is m double prime of zero minus the mean squared. So when the mean is zero, the, the second derivative is the variance. Okay? The second derivative at the origin is zero. It's the variance. Okay. So then, um, if I define Sn equals the sum xi, i goes from zero to n, and divide by the square root of n and times sigma. Okay. Well, no, I'm going to define this in that way. I'm sorry. I'm going to define this the sum, Sn. Then, if I normalize the sum, then the probability that Sn divided by the square root of n times sigma, less than or equal to x, um, then this limit, as n goes to infinity, so this is the distribution function of, of this Sn by the square root of n sigma um, is equal to for every x, where this is the standard normal distribution function, equals the interval minus infinity to x, 1 over the square root of 2i, into the minus z squared over 2 d dz. The cumulative distribution function of the standard normal variable. Is that a proof? No, this is a statement of a theorem. Oh. function of Sn is going to exist on minus delta of delta, which is the product of these individual ones. Okay. So that's not going to be a problem. The moment generating function of this Sn by the square root of n sigma is also going to exist on even a bigger interval. Okay? So let's see. Okay, so there's no problem here. But now uh, and now I just prove that the moment generating function of this random variable, so Zn equals Sn over the square root of n sigma. Okay, this is my Zn. I apply. function of the standard normal is going on minus infinity, so that's consistent. Okay? So what I need to show is that the moment generating function of this random variable converges to the moment generating function up there. Okay? What mu equals is zero. And with sigma equal to one. Okay? Because I've taken the sigma out here. Right. This is mu equal to zero. Sigma equal to one. Okay? Standard normal CDN. So how would um, mu not equaling zero and 
sigma not equaling one change? I would change this to I would uh, if uh, if I put the mu here, okay, then I would put n mu here, okay. That's the only thing that's going to change, okay. And then double prime, I would have to put um, m double n m prime of zero squared equals to sigma squared. I have to put that in minus mu squared equals to sigma squared. I have to change that, okay. I just have to set it. Okay. So what you're trying to do is, is take some distribution and fit it to the same curve using mean invariance as, as a standard normal. Right. Right. But so this, that's right. I mean, why this why this normalization? This is called this is called normalization. If I take if x i has mean mu and variance sigma squared, I take the sum. What's the uh, and then I do this normalization or subtract the mean of the sum and divide by the standard deviation of the sum. But I get something that has mean zero and variance one. Right? Just check that. That's why that's why the word normal <laughs> comes in, because I'm doing this normalization. S n minus n mu over the square root of n sigma. What's the expectation of that? Well, since the expectation of Sn is n mu, right? And then I subtracted n mu, and a, this is just a linear factor. So this is equal to zero, n mu minus n mu by linearity over the square root of n sigma equals to zero. So that's mean zero. And what's the variance of Sn minus n mu over the square root of n sigma? Thanks, Al. Should have pointed this out. Okay, this is equal to one over the square root of n sigma squared. Okay, times the variance of S n. I can kill this n mu because it's a constant. All right. What's the variance of S n? Well, the variance of S n is n random variables independent, each has variance sigma squared. So this is one over the square root of n sigma squared times n sigma squared. Okay, that equals one. So we've normalized the random variable to have mean zero and variance one. And what we're saying now is when n is large, that really does look like a standard normal variable in terms of its probabilities. Its density kind of might look a lot like it if it has a density. It doesn't have to have a density, though. The axis could be discrete random variables. Alright? Because the probability mass function. Density, but it always has this, this cumulative distribution function. We're saying that if I fix any x, I can just probably that this random variable less than or equal to x, let n go to infinity, I get the limit is capital phi of x. Well, what is, how do you change how is n big, big enough or not? Just from experience and examples and things like that. There are error terms. So you can take, there are error terms. You assume moment generating functions and so on, and it, you know. In terms of things, you can make a difference here and have a, a bound. Okay. For this theorem holds whether you have a moment generating function or not. All you need to assume is a mean and a variance. You still get the limit. Okay. For our proof in the test, we assume the moment generating function because the proof is fairly easy when you assume a moment generating function. But it can be proved without the assumption of the moment generating. function. You just need second points. Then the convergence can be pretty bad, pretty slow. All right? Well, if you don't have a moment generating function, how do you have a second moment? You can have a second moment without a moment generating function. Stop. You just don't have a third moment. You have like a two plus two and a two and a tenth moment, and that's it. You don't get any more. Moment two point one. Okay, you know more. You have, you have like examples like that. You have one of the test practice tests. Okay. Or, yeah, tell me where, how many moments you get. What do you mean by moments? You know, like x squared. Or yeah, how many? You know, you don't have integrals forever. If I've got if f of x is uh, four x to the minus five, where x squared equal to one, that's a density. Okay. Mm -hmm. I can have a third moment, but I don't have a fourth moment. Why not? Integral 
x to the fourth times f of x dx, x goes from 1 to infinity. You see, after the integral, x to the fourth times 4, x to the minus 5 dx from 1 to infinity equals integral 4 over x dx from 1 to infinity. That gives you a log of log. singularity. Right. Log of infinity is infinity. Oh. Okay. So it doesn't exist. Right. The fourth moment doesn't exist. The third moment does. But the fifth? Fifth moment really doesn't exist. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, all right. So, moments and moment generating functions. So, you don't need infinitely many moments. You don't even need a moment generating function for this there. For the proof, before it uses a moment generating function. Maybe I'll skip the proof for today. It's a nice proof, though. Okay. The proof basically is to apply theorem A, proof method, apply theorem A, show that the moment generating function of Sn over the square root of n sigma, we, we need to find, we subtracted zero here in this case, of t goes, as n goes to infinity, to e to the t squared over 2. Okay? And that's all you do. Okay? And it's pretty straightforward. Except you need a little asymptotic expansion of the logarithm of 1 plus x, which some of you may not be familiar with from your Taylor series days. Okay. <laughs> but there are lots of you use asymptotics. Right? Log 1 plus x is x minus x squared over 2 plus something smaller and so on and so forth. And you basically get f use, um, that kind of stuff. So, uh, this is a calculation is what it amounts to at this point. Yeah, maybe we, have, we might have one or two minutes. Do you want to look at it? See what that looks like? No. Okay. Oh. <laughs> yeah, there's a page and a half of calculations. You do not want to read that, okay? You have to sit down. The only way to do this is sit down with a pencil and paper and basically take the lines of the proof and try to fill in all the gaps yourself. Okay? And then you see, oh, you look on the page and see what you wrote. Oh, yeah, that looks pretty good. Okay. Oh, I'll do it that way then. Okay. So you have to sit down with a pencil and paper and just do that. Okay. I think we tried to spell out the central mystery of why this, why you always get this the normal, and that is because uh, we we did say that the moment generating function of well the characteristic function you can do it using see how do you do it if you don't have a moment generating function you use the characteristic function the characteristic function is phi of t equals expectation e to the i t uh, z. Okay? That? So that always exists. If this is a real random variable, mm -hmm. instead of a t z, you put i t z, where i is the uh, square root of minus one, complex number, pure complex number, pure com complex unit, right? So, Why use a complex number? Yeah, you use complex numbers. This is just you know, a complex number, but it's bounded in absolute value by one. So this expectation has to exist. Because the random variable is a bounded random variable. It's bounded by one in absolute value. The most you could ever get is one in absolute value for the expectation. So this always exists. Even if you don't even have moments at all. Okay? No moments. This exists. Okay? So... If I now have uh, first and second moment, though, at least, then I, then I can apply this transparent method. I still get the central limit there. Okay. And so, uh, I think the, the uh, if I replace t by it, what do I get here? I get e to the minus t squared over 2. In other words, the moment gen the uh, characteristic function, the transform is the same as the original density. Okay. That's kind of central to the mystery. Essential limits that we're getting the function e to the minus x squared over 2 
I have that function start with in my transform is equal to minus t squared. Okay. That at least makes sense. Maybe in your mind does it make sense? <laughs> does it? Okay. How do you get that? E to the minus x squared over two transforms. Uh, uh, because like I said, I already have this. I'll replace t by it and get minus t squared over two. in the exponent. We <laughs> both have minus signs now. Okay. <laughs> Why does the top one have a minus sign? That's right. The original, the density of, of the North standard normal has a minus sign in it. Mm-hmm. Density. Yeah, but you transform it to this thing, the phi of t thing, right? Yeah. And then you transform it back, it's the same? Yeah. Wow. What happened to the i? Got squared. Oh. Got squared. Yes, got squared. Minus i squared is minus one. Okay. okay. Let's just skip the proof. Let's skip the proof. It's okay to ask. I like the questions. We like teasing cheat. He's gonna get them all the answers right anyway. Okay. Let's do an example. The round off error in approximating a number by an integer. Suppose I have, I'm trying to balance my checkbook in the good old days when I actually used to use the paper and I wrote down my checks and stuff like that. Look at the internet every seven days or whatever day. How much money did I spend? <laughs> in the good old days, <laughs> like I did that until I ran out of check registers. I still would do it if I, if I didn't run out of check registers. But now getting check registers is harder and harder because you gotta order the checks and get the check register and not run out and all that stuff. But anyway, I'll still use them. But do you ever use a check register? No. <laughs> I wondered about this generation. What's a check register? <laughs> What's a check? What's a check? A check. Some people still use checks. Okay, a check looks like this. Same discussion about slide rules. <laughs> I've never seen a slide rule, but I know what it is. And pagers? Okay, let's pretend though. Okay, let's pretend like in your IRS, you do at least do deal with the IRS, probably. Internal Revenue Service? <laughs> okay. Some people still do. Some people actually write out their forms, probably still. But you have to put numbers in, right? But they don't ask you to, to uh, put the, the pennies in. Right? They don't ask you to put anything, you only pure dollars, dollar amounts. Uh -huh. Okay. So anyway, that's the context where you round things off. The round off error in approximating a number by an integer is modeled with this uniform random variable interval minus one half to one half. Uniform random variable. So like, we round off like the zero to uh, off on the interval minus one half to one half to minus fifty cents to plus fifty cents. Does that make sense? If I, if, oh, okay. If so if you receive a number, it's rounded off. You round it off to the nearest integer by the usual round off rule. Okay. If it's fifty one, if it's fifty one cents or higher, you round up. If it's forty nine cents or more, you round down. It's fifty cents. Okay. Okay. Is whether you can round up or round down. Okay. Which number is best for your tax purposes? Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> I don't think it's going to make a bunch of difference. But 50, yeah. So 50 cents rounded up is usually the rule, but. Um, I round it up. However you want. Okay. They're not going to care by a few pennies. Okay. Here and there. So you say it's a. Oh. Okay. Uniform random variable. Uniform random variable minus one one half to one half. Okay. Okay. 
So well, it's not quite right because it would be you have, have to have to infinitely many digits. Cents. You have to have infinitely many digits to really do it, right? Because uh, it's a discrete random variable. Okay, it's minus um, whatever it is. Fifty to point four nine. Yeah, it's some kind of thing like that. So you know, it's a hundred. So this is a this is just even. This wouldn't be a bad model at all if you. I mean, it's a correct model if you actually put in the correct rule. Okay. But now let's make a continuous random variable. Okay, that's close enough. Okay. All right? So, if 100 independent numbers are added, according to the round off rule, how far, what's the chance that we were, we were off from the true answer by 5 in absolute value? Within five or greater than that. The total round off errors, which would just be the sum of the errors, exceeds five in absolute value. Well, that's not really a thing. That's an error by the amount of the sum of the errors. Okay, so that's what this is for uh, random over u i and minus one half to one half. Okay, so we're going to take independent u's, but now they're minus one half to one half. So this is R n. So I want the probability that R n and that's the value is greater than or equal to five. So is that like saying uh, okay. that the IRS will lose or gain five dollars or more? Yeah, yeah, I mean, if you're off by five dollars, if you actually had, if you actually had to do this rounding thing a hundred times in your tax form, okay, what's the chance that you would be off by five dollars or more? Okay, is that what? Audit. Yeah, I mean that's, I mean it's five dollars is a trivial amount, right? The IRS they care less, right? So. Let's see what the chance is. Okay. Chance so, is small, right? Uh, well, let's see. Small. Let's actually see how big the problem is. Okay. So, uh, what's the expected value of UY? That's equal to zero. So that means expected value of RN is equal to zero. Okay. What's the variance of a uniform? One twelve. It's uh, one half. So the square of the length of the interval. divided by 12, which is 1 over 12, because the length of the interval is 1, <laughs> okay? Okay, 1 squared divided by 12 equals 1 12. That's a variance. So the variance of Rn is therefore equal to 100 over 12. So some of the variances. Variances add, okay? So this is the probability. This is obviously by symmetry. This is twice probability that R is bigger than 5, okay? Why does... Because I put absolute value of R. Obviously, this, obviously R has an exactly symmetric distribution, okay? Okay? So I could be off by $5 on the plus or minus side, right? I don't need to think about which plus or minus means here, okay? I don't want to think about it. Okay, <laughs> this is twice the probability that R is bigger than 5. So you have to normalize it? So now I have to normalize, which is twice the probability that I have to subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation, which is the square root of 112. Bigger than 5 minus 0 over the square root of 112. So I have to subtract the mean on both sides of the inequality and divide both sides of the inequality by the standard deviation of the 
of Rn. Okay? I take that. And so that just gives me a z score. What I do is in, in statistics courses, I just call that z. I just call little z equal 5 over the square root of 112, 112 which is equal to um, 112 is, well, I can actually, that actually comes down to the square root of 5, I believe. Um, or square root of something, what does it come down to? Square root of 3 is what it comes down to. This is 25 thirds. Okay, so it comes down to the square root of 3. Okay? Which is 1.73. Okay, so now I want the probability of standard, twice the probability of standard normal is bigger than 1.73. This is approximately a standard normal variable. Okay. So. Oh yeah, on the test, are you going to provide that table? Yes. So that would be something with the practice sheet that I should have applied to give you the table, but I didn't want to spend the paper. Okay? So you'll have to get that table. Uh, you'll have table on page A7 of the appendix. So by table, page A7, you get, um, find that, so this is approximately two times phi, let's see now, one, one minus phi of 1.73, because it's the upper tail. Everybody's familiar with that kind of stuff from that first course, I'm hoping. Just two times one minus um, one half five eight. Okay. Five eight two. All right. Two point zero eight four something like that. So it's about eight percent chance. So if you put ten dollars in here, ten, then you get um, z equals three point five roughly, and the probability is essentially zero. I mean, very very close zero. to zero. Very close to zero. Four digits, zero. So you can have a five dollar error, but you can't have a ten dollar error. That's just not a question. And this in one hundred transactions. Okay. It doesn't matter the amount. No, because we just run from the nearest dollar. The actual amounts of the transactions don't matter. Uh -huh. Only if they're independent. Okay? They're not independent transactions, that's a different story. <laughs> okay. Alright, if you add the same error 100 times, you're going to get 100 times that error. Okay? So you could get an error up to 50. Alright? Error could be 50, plus 50, or minus 50. Okay, if they're not independent. So the independence is critical here. So there's your example. Then there's the re then there's using the table backwards. Okay. Which I guess we'll have to save until next time. Oh. I have one more example on these notes, which is uh, problem uh, 523 and 524. To look at estimating the area. How many points will I need to estimate the area of some shape in the plane? Okay? Let's do that next time. So, are you going to be able to finish your homework for Thursday, you think? Can you be uh -huh. able to cover that? Yeah. Okay. Do you want the Go. program or do you just want the answer? For number 19 or something like that. Just give me this. It's like a three line program. Please just write something down. Okay. okay. Just for your own record. Okay. Okay.